Please open your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And our text is really going to be focusing on verses 17 through 27. But I'd like to start in verse 1 and read verses 1 through 27 to get the context. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had not been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Earlier last week when I was preparing this lesson, I began to put together a series of ideas of what I wanted to do, and the lesson just got to be uh, too big. It really exploded and got out of hand. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the resurrection of Lazarus. And I want us to approach it from the perspective of what can we learn about our relationship to Jesus in these passages. Now, we understand that we have a relationship with God the Father and that Jesus, in many ways, restores this. You know, our relationship to God is something we lost uh, back at Eden. And now it's something that is restored through Jesus. But I want us to go through this and really focus on our relationship to Jesus, who He is. And this morning, we're going to be focusing on our relationship to Jesus in His identity who he claims to be, where he comes from, where he's going, what he likes and what he dislikes, you know, his, his personality, who is Jesus, and what do we need to uh, be prepared for? What do we need to expect when we have a relationship with him? And that's what I'd like us uh, to focus on this morning. A relationship is really when uh, two lives are inextricably intertwined together. You can't pull them apart. The clearest of example of this is probably family. You, know, you have the relationship between spouses, and you have relationships between the siblings. You have relationships uh, between parent and child. You know, these, these relationships are, are when their lives are all together. We're connected to one another. And then you have 
uh, you know, you go to the next step and you have your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and your grandparents and you have relationships with them, whether you really want to or not. They're, they're people who are in our lives, whether we want them there or not. And maybe one of the greatest misnomers we use is when we say uh, the end of a relationship. Because relationships never really end. They change. But a relationship never really ends. There are people I know who have died, and my relationship with them in my past still affects me today. In, in a sense, that relationship is actually still alive and still affecting me. You know, people may get divorced, but the relationship hasn't ended. It's changed. It's different. Relationships in many ways are like, uh, like adhesive on an envelope, you know, very high quality adhesive. You can stick it to there, but you can't unstick it. You can tear the paper, but you can't unstick the glue. Relationships are extremely powerful. They transcend geographical locations. They transcend time. There are people in my past who are alive, and I think about them. I wonder how they're doing. What are they like? How, do, how would I relate to them today? And they still affect me. I still have a relationship with them in some way. And a relationship then is not just the intermingling of, of lives, but really of identities. You know, who I am, where I've been, and where I'm going, and how this relates to someone else, where they've been, who they are, and where they're going, what they like and what they dislike. And this all brushes and goes together, and identities, for us at least, are, are many ways fluid. Because I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago, and many people I know are not the same people they were 10 years ago. And we have a relationship with Jesus. Everyone has a relationship with Jesus. Some people may not have a good relationship or a healthy relationship with Him, but He, he is in a relationship with everyone today. Even if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you are still in a relationship with Him. He has forever changed human history. We keep track of our years based on Jesus. I mean, I can't, I can't make an entire civilization do that. I can't make people do that. We are in a relationship with Jesus, and I want us to understand through this passage what that means based on who he is, what he likes, what he dislikes, and really what we need to expect when Jesus comes into our lives with his identity. Because he has, uh, he has in some ways a pattern of behavior that he's demonstrated himself in these Gospels. Now the first thing we're going to look at is that to be in a relationship with Jesus means to be in a relationship with someone who will come to you when you call to him. Now that sounds very simple, but you have to understand how profound that is, especially when we're talking about deity. You know, in this time, when we're talking about polytheism, they would call to gods, gods wouldn't come. Gods, they'd be lucky if God answered. If they called to, to Zeus or Hermes or someone, they would be lucky if Hermes or Zeus answered. And if they, they'd be even luckier if they answered and did something nice. But Jesus is the kind of person who will come to you when you call to him. In verse 3 uh, of chapter 11, it says, So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, not only will Jesus come to you when you call to him, but he's also the kind of person who will answer your question whether you specifically state it or not. You think about this. All they said was, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That's all they said. They didn't ask Jesus to come. And yet Jesus knows what they're asking. He knows the intentions of their heart. He doesn't make them rework it. He, you know, they don't even say please. He doesn't tell them, you've got to say please. He still comes to them. He still arrives. And... Uh, not only does he arrive, which is amazing enough, but he does exactly what they ask, even though they don't specifically state it. 
All they said was, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And what they're asking is, Jesus, will you please come and restore Lazarus to his full health? That's what they're asking. And that's exactly, to be fair, what Jesus does. Now, he doesn't heal him of illness. He heals him of death. But Jesus answers this, and he says yes. Which means we need to be prepared for this. If we're in a relationship with Jesus where we actually call to him, we need to understand he will come. And not only will he come when we call to him, he'll come uh, in the exact way we want him to arrive, whether we specifically state it or not, but he'll also do things. You see, these women, they're, when they're weeping and they're sorrowful, they don't just ask Jesus to listen to them. This is something I think we've all experienced, where we're going through a difficult time and we just, we just want someone to listen to us. We don't want them to, to fix our problems. I just want you to listen. Please just listen for a moment. Jesus will listen, but he will also act. He will also do things. He is not only a listener, he, he is someone who does things and acts in our lives, and he acts in ways that are totally irreversible and cannot be undone. That's who he is. That's what it means uh, to be in a relationship with Jesus. That's a part of his very identity, is to come into someone's life when they ask him to, and to completely change their lives and turn everything they ever knew on its head. You, have, you thought water could just be water all the time? Well, now it can be wine. How are you the same after you see something like that? How is the world the same after you see that? You, you read in Acts and there are these people like Stephen and James who are so affected by Jesus irreversibly that they go to their deaths in the name of Christ. He acts in people's lives in ways that are completely irreversible. He is about to raise someone from the dead. How do you unsee that? How do you unexperience that? How are you Mary or Martha, one of these Jews who are here, and you see Lazarus come out of the tomb, and then what do you do next? What do you, you go home and you make dinner and pretend like nothing happened? How are you ever the same? Jesus will not only come to us when we call to him, he will also act, and he'll act in a way that can never be undone. That's who he is. That's his identity. To come into the world and to change things forever. Now Jesus will not only come when he's called, but we also learn about Jesus is that he asks people to do difficult things. He'll ask people to do difficult things but it's nothing he won't do himself. I hope you noticed that Jesus risked his life by going to raise Lazarus from the dead. You read in verse 7, it says, Then after this he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Just in chapter 10, the Jews were seeking to stone Jesus. In fact, you read the words of Thomas and the words of total resignation in verse 16. Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. He totally expects to die. Is completely convinced of it. And yet Jesus is not willing to ask the disciples to do anything he's not willing to do himself. He's going to go risk his life. You know, for us as Christians, to be in a relationship with Jesus means that we are, in many ways, this same model. We are soldiers in enemy territory. Jesus went into hostile territory. Bethany is two miles away from Jerusalem. That's not that far. In just a matter of hours, any of these Jews who were here could have gone to Jerusalem, gotten authorities, and came and either arrested Jesus or stoned him. Jesus went into hostile territory and that's exactly what we're expected to do. Jesus asks of us difficult things, but it's nothing he's unwilling to do himself. Jesus asks us 
to go to difficult places, such as Bethany. Sometimes he asks us to go to difficult places in our lives to really geographically change location. You, you have to go somewhere else. That's who he is. That's what he asks of people. And oftentimes, going to a different location, the reason an area is hostile, not always, but usually, is because of the people there. I mean, how, how, how difficult would it be to live in Nazi Germany if there are no Nazis? It's the people there who make it difficult. Jesus asks us to be around difficult people and in difficult places. You know, he's around people who are mourning Mary and Martha. He asks us to be around people who are mourning. It's not easy to be around people who are mourning. It's uncomfortable. But it's not something Jesus is unwilling to do himself. Going to difficult places is not just a difficult geographical location. It can sometimes be a place of mind. Sometimes he asks us to go to a difficult place that is psychologically difficult to go through. I hope you also noticed Jesus on purpose waited two days for Lazarus to die. It says in verse 6, So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. You know what it meant for Mary and Martha to be in a relationship with Jesus? It's for Jesus to take them to a place that is psychologically difficult to go to. To endure the death of a sibling. To watch someone you love who is in pain and is ill and then dies. He asked that of them. But what did Jesus do? He then went to them and he mourned with them. Jesus sometimes asks us to go to places that are difficult to go to. That's exactly what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus. That's who he is. But he's not going to take us anywhere that he's unwilling to go himself. He himself went to Mary and Martha in their difficulty, in their anxiety, in their suffering, and he wept with them. This is exactly what we see, uh, like in Psalm 23, where David writes, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And then he says, for thou art with me. The reason David has no fear going through the valley of the shadow of death is because God goes through it with him. It's not because God never makes him go through the valley of the shadow of death. It's because when he goes through it, God goes through it with him. That's who Jesus is. That's what it means to have a relationship with God's Messiah is that he will ask you to endure and go to difficult places that can be psychologically difficult. Jesus will also ask us to believe things that are difficult to believe. That's who he is. And that's what it means to be in relationship with him. He's going to ask you to, do, to believe something that is difficult to believe. He says in verse 14, Lazarus has died and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. I mean, in this sentence alone, Jesus says, I'm glad Lazarus died. I'm glad. Do you believe that? That's not an easy thing to believe. Jesus is going to take Mary and Martha and he's going to push them outside of where they believe, and then he's going to tell, ask them, do you believe me now? And he's going to push them farther and say, do you believe me now? And he's going to give them every reason to trust him. You see, Martha believes that Jesus can heal Lazarus of illness. Mary believes this too. That's why they sent this message to him. They totally believe Jesus can heal Lazarus. But then Jesus gets there, and he says, uh, Martha says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Does she trust Jesus or does she trust God? She's separating the two, isn't she? She's almost acting as if Jesus is just a prophet where he can just ask God and God can heal Lazarus. 
And Jesus is going to say, you don't understand. You don't understand. She thinks he can heal Lazarus, and Jesus waited for Lazarus to die to push them outside of where they believe, and then he's going to say, do you believe me now? He says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yeah, you believe that I can heal Lazarus. Do you believe I can raise him from the dead? Do you believe this? We have to be prepared for that. To be in a relationship with Jesus means for him to take us by the hand, lead us to the edge of the cliff, and then before you jump, he's going to ask you, do you believe? Do you trust me? And then he's going to give you every reason to trust him. To be in a relationship with Jesus means that Jesus, you're in a relationship with the kind of person who is going to push you beyond what you're comfortable with. He's going to ask difficult things of you, to go to difficult places. He's going to ask you to believe difficult things. That's who he is. That's his personality. The last thing is that Jesus, if you're in a relationship with him, is going to show you firsthand that the power of God is not theoretical. It's not theory. It's not something that happens later. This exchange between Jesus and Martha is so representative of both Christians and non-Christians today. Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection, uh, on, in the resurrection on the last day. What is she doing here? I mean, she's really explaining away his words. But you don't really mean that. You mean something different, right? You, you mean this resurrection stuff. The stuff in the future that is really abstract and it, it's probably true. You don't really mean that, Jesus. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. When Martha says this, what is she saying when she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day? It's really, to me, very similar to what people say today. Like, oh, Jesus just meant that spiritually. Like, he didn't really mean that. He, he just, he meant that spiritually. Which is, uh, to me, another way of saying, that's too silly to be true. I can't believe that. There's no way he meant that, because if he meant that, he's lying. Or he just meant that spiritually. You know, when we talk about, when we say that he just meant that spiritually, the Bible doesn't depict spiritually as something that is unreal. The Bible depicts our world to be one where there is, uh, there is the natural and there is the supernatural. And the supernatural interacts with the natural. One of the, the ideologies that has really crept into the churches is uh, that of naturalism, which says there is no supernatural, and that every, every phenomena can be explained by purely natural means. I, I think I've said this before. There's one time I did a lesson on uh, Jesus casting out the demons from the man with the legion. And afterward, a man came up to me. And I know the man, he's very intelligent. He is a scientist. And he said to me, I don't think Jesus cast out demons. The man just had a split personality. Well, that, that creates a lot of difficulty. That's like what Thomas Jefferson wrote in his, the Jefferson Bible in the introduction. In his own words, he says that the, the gospel writers were uneducated men who didn't know what they were writing about. And so Thomas Jefferson now has the task of finding what's real and what isn't. And he did. He took a pen knife and glue and tape and he cut it out. And he wrote his own, he cut out scripture and made his own what's called the Jefferson Bible. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. I know that there's something that you're saying is true, but what you're saying is too good to be true. It can't be true. And Jesus says, you don't understand. 
I mean, verse 25 could very easily start with the words, you don't understand. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you're familiar with John's Gospel and John's Gospel, when he uses this I am, he records a number of I am statements by Jesus, which in the Greek is ego eimi, and it's Jesus' statement of deity. Jesus is referring back to when Moses was at the burning bush, and Moses asked, who should I say sent me? And in the Greek Old Testament, which these writers had, God responds, ego eimi, right? tell them I am sent you. And Jesus, on purpose, she's saying, you know, you can ask from God, and God can do this. And Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. You're making me out to be something I'm not. For the problem is, there's, a very, there's inconsistency here in Martha's words, because on one hand, she thinks she's, he's human, but on the other hand, you go to verse 27, and she says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Where is he coming from? Right? She's treating Jesus as if he's from here. He's not from here. I mean, technically speaking, he's not even from this planet, right? He's not from here. She's treating Jesus as if he's a prophet, as if he's elevated person. As if he's just an elevated human. And Jesus is saying, I'm not an elevated human, I'm deity humbled. There's a difference. I am the resurrection. I'm not dust become divine, I'm divine who put on dust. I am the resurrection and the life. Life itself has no power apart from Jesus. Do we really understand? Life itself has no power apart from Jesus. <clears throat> He is the resurrection. We get steamrolled by life and by death. It just kind of happens to us, whether we want it to or not. Jesus couldn't be steamrolled by life any more than a steamroller can steamroll over itself. He is the resurrection. He controls who lives and who dies. This is up to him. He, on purpose, waited for Lazarus to die, and then he raised him from the dead. He's the resurrection. He's the life. He has that kind of power. If we really got that, we would treat other people so much differently, I think. We understand they have no life apart from Jesus. Right? They're in a relationship with Jesus whether they know it or not, whether they want to be or not. Because He is the resurrection. That's what it means for us to be in a relationship with Jesus, is to be in a relationship with someone whose very identity is life itself. That's what it means to be in a relationship with the Christ. He's not a man who just had good teachings. He is someone who's not from here. He is God made flesh. To be in a relationship with Jesus includes many things we have to be aware of. We need to be prepared for the fact that Jesus will ask difficult things of us. Ask us to go to difficult places. He's going to ask us to endure difficult things. To believe things that may be difficult to believe, but He's going to make sure you have every reason to believe Him and trust Him. To be in relationship with Jesus, then, is also to be in relationship with life itself. The very source. He is the resurrection. The great thing we learn about the resurrection of Lazarus is that Je th this is the reason Jesus came. Jesus did not come to teach good ethics. He came to raise the dead. He came to take sinners who are dead in sin and to bring them back to life. That's who He is. That's His identity. And that's what it means to be in a relationship with the Messiah. Now, if you're here this morning and you are not in a relationship with Jesus, but you'd like to be, we, have, we can help you do that. We have waters of baptism. We can talk with you, pray with you, and teach you. If you're here this morning and you would like prayers, or you would like a class, or if there's anything at all that we can do for you as the church, please make that known to us.
or you can come forward now while we stand and sing the invitation song.